Zanny Minton Bedos, editor in chief of The Economist, is here to explain. Very good to be with you, Zanny. Very nice to see you too, Ian, as always. So, the big fight right now the Americans and Chinese gloves are off. Do you think we are now heading into a new Cold War? Well, we are certainly in a period of really terrible US-China relations, and they've been getting worse for years. And this year, in particular, as the pandemic hit, and even, frankly, in the last few weeks, things have got worse and worse. China has taken over the premises of the US consulate in the southwestern city of Chengdu. It ordered the diplomatic mission there to close in response to the United States closing the Chinese consulate in Houston, Texas, last week. Do I think it's a new Cold War? Well, I have some issues with the framing Cold War. The old Cold War was between the USSR and the USA, the USSR, the Soviet Union, very important nuclear power, ideological foe, but frankly, economic minnow. The difference with China is that China is a huge economy with which we're very integrated. So I'm not sure the phrase is the right one, but yes, we are heading to very, very worrying relationship between these two countries. Now, before we get into what's at stake, um, I, I kind of want to go back a bit, because if we think about 1989 and the wall came down, the Soviets had their Gorbachev, but the Chinese, I mean, Tiananmen Square, very different lesson, right? I mean, we didn't win that. I think two very important things happened in 1989. One, as you say, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the, the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union, and with it, the sense that the US had won the Cold War. And, you know, Frank Fukuyama publishes the end of history with a question mark. And there is a sense of, you know, the ideological supremacy of liberal, Western liberalism is there. And there's that kind of unipolar moment, US reigns supreme. The other thing that happened, as you say, in 1989 was Tiananmen Square. And I think what we're realizing now is that what happened in Tiananmen Square actually is sort of, you know, the, the shadow of that is driving the early 21st century much more than the aftermath of the hubristic moment of 1990 in the sense of US, you know, unipolarity. So, you know, if we, you're right that the expectation was I think in the you know, 1990s, 2000s, that as China integrated into the world economy, there would be, a China would be created that would be a responsible stakeholder that would, the most optimistic people hoped, become you know, a more democratic, more liberal place. The expectation in some sense was that what had happened in other parts of the post-Cold War world would happen in China. And I think what we've learned is that that gamble, that expectation has been proved wrong. China has indeed grown extraordinarily. The most amazing, you know, poverty reduction we've ever seen, the world has ever seen, an unbelievable increase in standards of living. The Chinese economy has grown dramatically, but it has not really become, in important ways, a responsible economic stakeholder. And at the same time, and now increasingly under President Xi Jinping, really obviously, it's becoming, you know, if anything, more authoritarian. And so that, that sort of underpinning that... The logic that said, if you bind China into the global system, it will become you know, more like the rest of the system, doesn't seem to have been upheld. And I think now what we face is the consequences of how do we deal with a China that is the world's second biggest economy, that has incredible links with all of our economies, it's a very, very powerful player, that is increasingly assertive, but which has a very different ideological framework. It is absolutely not a democracy or going to be anything like that but it is a country with which we're really interlinked. So we think about what's happening now, and you know, you, you put a, a very clear point that the Americans and Chinese do need each other. Um, do you think, I mean, right now in the United States, uh, being hawkish on China uh, you know, is, is almost the only game in town. Do you think that's appropriate? And, and if so, how much so? There has been in the U.S. over the past few years a growing recognition on both sides of the aisle that the old approach wasn't working. But at a kind of level of trade and the economy narrowly, China wasn't playing by the rules and that integration and access to the WTO hadn't really changed China. At the same time, it was, you know, catching up very dramatically and very rapidly in technology 
and it was, you know, it is an authoritarian regime. And so there was a kind of, you know, realization in the US that all those three put together that rather than being a kind of strategic partner, America suddenly thought of China as the strategic competitor and a rather worrying one. And so the question I think that the US has been grappling with and everybody else sort of by extension is how do you deal with a country with which your economies are extremely integrated. You know, think of global supply chains, think of the number of companies that produce things in China, think of the integration. And so how can you safely continue that integration, continue that interaction with a country whose ideology you absolutely don't share and that you fundamentally don't trust? And I think what the US has been going through in the past three, four years, um, accentuated by the president and the Trump administration, because as so often, President Trump, in a kind of somewhat clumsy and transactional and crude way, identifies a real issue. Then, I, and we can talk about this, but I think has, has not necessarily gone about trying to deal with it in the right way, but certainly shone a spotlight on it. And at the same time, I think, and it really has been the last three to four years, this hardening on both sides of the aisle in the US of attitudes toward China. President Nixon once said, he feared he had created a Frankenstein by opening the world to the CCP. And here we are. But, but what I don't think we have yet is a consensus or indeed a kind of strategic sense about how you go from the old world where you hope that integrating with China would make it a responsible stakeholder to managing relations with a country with which you are integrated but which you no longer trust. So the, the simple, which is kind of why I find this um, metaphor of the new Cold War or, or, or this adage not that helpful because the new Cold War suggests, well, it'll be like the old Cold War. You know, we'll have nuclear deterrence, we'll have military buildup, we'll, we'll disentangle our economies. But let's just think through what that means. It means really an unwinding of a lot of the globalization we've had so far. It means, what does it mean for third countries? What does it mean for countries in Europe? What does it mean for countries in the emerging world who have very close links with both economies? So I think we, we haven't really thought through how to do it, let alone how do we deal with the kind of common challenges we all face? And the pandemic is the obvious one, but climate change, all these huge global challenges, which we can only deal with if the US and China can work together. It's not so easy for the Europeans right now figuring out how they're supposed to balance uh, between these two behemoths that are not getting along on any front. So tell me, where, do you think, I mean, is it a foregone conclusion because we ostensibly share political systems and values and the rest that the UK and the Europeans are basically all gonna be in the American camp? I think, well, I think the UK has shown in the last couple of weeks with its decision on Huawei to now ban Huawei that it, when forced to choose between a kind of big supplier and a close ally, it was gonna go with a close ally. Uh, it's not clear to me that every country in Europe will do that and the calculus will shift. And the further you go to the emerging world where countries have huge economic ties with China, um, but are very untrusting of it and very suspicious of it, it becomes a much more difficult calculus. The, the hawks in the Trump administration would say, actually, the dangers of military confrontation go up if we ignore this. It's now when there's still asymmetrical power towards the United States, China's the second largest economy. They don't have the military capabilities. They're still comparatively weak. This is when we need to pressure them as much as humanly possible uh, in order to align uh, to get them to play more by American rules or else. This is going to hurt them a so, lot more so than it hurts me, the West. I, I've heard that argument too. That's the argument you hear from a lot of, uh, from a lot of US hawks. But, but let's play that through because my question always then is, okay, but what is your end goal? What is, what is it you're actually trying to get China to do? Because I think there is a growing view in China that what the US really wants is to keep China down to prevent China from returning to what it sees as its rightful place at the kind of world's top table. And I think, you know, similarly, in the US, there is a growing view that what China seeks is sort of global domination. Um, and, and kind of Xi Jinping has some sort of expansionist, global, uh, hegemonic ambition of his own. Those two visions are fundamentally incompatible. So unless both sides can find a strategic um, vision that they can both sign up to that allows them to sort of acknowledge the other giant power's existence, we're in real trouble. And I would hope that one can do that, that even with countries 
who have a fundamentally different ideology that you don't trust, that you don't, you know, share, that you frankly you find abhorrent, that you can find ways of dealing with those countries, not just to prevent a descent into military conflict, but also to tackle the, the global challenges that we need to tackle, you know, climate change, pandemics, and so and what's really profoundly depressing uh, about this particular moment is that in the face of a kind of, you know, the worst pandemic since 1918, which is, is ineluctably global in nature and demands a global response, we haven't had that. Not even close. In fact, we have the opposite. We, we have don't the opposite. have just countries so, so then the, the, fighting yeah, the question, yes. Absolutely. And the question then is, is this a function of, you know, it, you know how do you assign blame for that? And, and you know, which side, does either side have a kind of strategic approach? And the, the common, you know, I guess the sort of common way of putting it is that China thinks very, very, very long term, but we just don't know quite what their goals are. But that the US recently, at least, has been behaving in a rather short termist transactional manner. And I think there's some truth to that. I think that, you know, the Trump administration rightly diagnosed a problem, but I'm not sure that going about it in the form of sort of unilateral attacks, really not trying to bring allies along terribly effectively uh, in, without any sort of seemingly clear strategy of what the end goal is, is as effective as it would have been if, they'd, if the US were articulating a clearer strategic approach. Now, I wonder, I mean, clearly China is, uh, has been and is a rising power. And irrespective of what kind of end goals you impute for Xi Jinping, some level of accommodation needs to be made and some level of are you gonna let them be at the table needs to be answered. So, you know, I look for example at this Huawei issue where the United Kingdom and your prime minister had said that they wanted to work with Huawei, they were gonna let them in and there was an about face. Um, what do you think if there were a proper strategy between the US, the UK and allies is that strategy that we want to destroy Huawei? So let me let me kind of abstract from Huawei itself, because I think you have to take a couple of steps back. In a world of no trust, where you have where you don't trust this this beer moth of a trading partner at all, and you certainly are leery of its ideology and its underlying goals, what is the kind of trading architecture you could create for that? And I think that it involves thinking about what areas of your economy are critical such that you would not want to have any involvement from companies from that country. And I think it's, you know, it may well be that 5G is, is rightly on that side of the line. But I think what we haven't had is a kind of going through, you know, what is included? What is critical? What is not critical? Is it okay to buy T-shirts from China? I assume so. What is it not okay to do? Well, I mean, I, I mentioned the Huawei issue. Because, I mean, you said, well, maybe it's okay to sell T-shirts, presumably. Well, if Huawei's on the wrong side of the line and those T-shirts have chips in them, then it probably isn't, right? I mean, in the sense your, if that your anything... Argument, if, if, and if your argument is that Huawei, having Huawei infrastructure in your 5G is dangerous because, you know, it is unclear what they do, some parts of it are made in China, it's going to become harder now. You know, one part of the argument was that because of the recent US sanctions, the oversight of Huawei infrastructure that the UK had pioneered. You know, the UK has, for the last few years, had this special office that essentially looks at all Huawei infrastructure to make sure that it is OK. That process of, of oversight has become much harder because of the US sanctions. So that's one argument that you, can't, you can no longer trust. You can no longer verify. And in the absence of trust, if you can't verify, it's too dangerous. We convinced many countries, many countries, and I did this myself, for the most part, not to use Huawei because we think it's an unsafe security risk. But the, the second is that you have to think, well, what about, you know, Microsoft or, or Apple, who's, who's, you know, produces a huge amount in China? What, what, you know, what is it, what can we actually produce there? What can we, can, if we can't have any form of integration, that involves a much, much greater decoupling both of software and of hardware that I think anybody has thought through because the most extreme version is that you have to have two tech ecosystems, separate hardware, separate software companies, completely different. But even if you go down that route, 
then what do countries, the third party countries do if you're in Indonesia or in India or in Brazil? Yeah, they'll have to choose. There's no question. And, and, but uh, you put your finger on something we hadn't talked about yet, um, because we've been mostly framing this in terms of governments, but you mentioned Microsoft, you mentioned Apple. Um, do, do you see the, a sea change in the private sector, or do you think it's going to be much more divided over the coming years? I think it's going to be more divided. I think it's going to depend on where your main markets are, on what you're doing, on how big the and important the Chinese market is for you. Um, so I think a, you know a, a conglomerate based in Asia I will have a very different outlook to one based in the UK, certainly in the US. But I suspect that what we're seeing is the US itself is increasingly off limits to Chinese companies, I think, of all sorts, and that the US will be a sort of outlier. But the, the bit that will be tricky is what happens you know, what happens in Europe, what happens in Africa, what happens in the fast growing emerging markets. If we're thinking, you know, not one year, but 10 years, you know, what, what are we trying to create here? Uh, two other issues I want to get to um, that we haven't talked about. Uh, one, Hong Kong, uh, precisely because this is what's driven some of the harshest uh, blowback from the United Kingdom uh, with the functional ending of the one state, two systems rule. Uh, now that we have this new national security law. This is the end of Hong Kong. This is the end of one country, two system. But we see the Germans, the largest economy in Europe, saying we're not going to let Hong Kong affect our trading relationship with China. It's too important. But has China become functionally too big to really push back on on some of these critical political issues? Absolutely not. Absolutely not if the West acts in unison. Absolutely not. I mean, I think that, that what you're absolutely right, that Hong Kong has brought home very powerfully, I think, in the UK political circles, that what China is, is up to, and that it has essentially you know, ripped up the agreement that was there, that it is absolutely focused on what it sees as you know, its own uh, national security and preventing Hong Kong becoming any kind of you know, hotbed of a festering opposition to the regime. It is, it is you know, a very, very clear indication of where, of where China is now going and, and what sort of China it is. That said, I don't think it's at all too late or indeed at all un impossible for the West actually to have a really big impact on the way China behaves, if, particularly if, if the West acts in concert. But what I think is much harder is you know, the US is big enough that the US can make a difference with you know, individual actions you know, whether it's against individual companies or sanctions and so forth. And then, you know, one thing that the, the Trump administration has achieved is a real sense that in China that, you know, this hurts when the, when the U.S. acts. So I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I think that there's been a really important role played by the U.S. in the last few years. But what I think we haven't had is the development of a sort of strategic perspective. And I think that's, that's what we need. And that strategic perspective would ideally include the West acting in concert just as you know, the, the West did when we created the existing global trade rules. The Chinese economy rebounded from coronavirus faster than any other major economy, but also many in the West, with a lot of reason, have pointed the finger at the Chinese for having obscured, covered up the original outbreak. To what extent does there need to be a reckoning for the way that coronavirus initially emerged and was obscured by the Chinese government? So I don't really know what a reckoning would add up to. What I do think, uh, it, you know, I think this is a very powerful example of just how bad the relationship has got, just how kind of short-termist both sides are behaving and thinking, rather than China welcoming in outside observers and analysts to understand, you know, what had happened, how it had spread, where it's come from, you know, and rather than the US, as it did with Ebola, sort of taking the lead, given the, the you know, preeminence of its, its epidemiological talent and epidemiological institutions, we didn't have either of that. We had, as you say, China kind of refusing to acknowledge that it's had any role in this at all, and in, in fact, rather aggressively propagating an opposite uh, you know, opposite view through its diplomacy and so forth. And we've had, you know, President Trump talking about, you know, Kung flu and all of those kind of things. So, you know, both sides, I think, have, uh, are to blame for the fact that this has been, you know, a, a pandemic from a multilateral perspective has been appallingly handled. So I'm not sure that, uh, you know, a reckoning sounds to me like a kind of, you know, 
let's pin all the blame on you. I'm rather than pinning blame, I think it is much more like you know, how can we work together? There's an enormous amount that we need to work together on. You know, it's not just getting a vaccine; it's making sure that the vaccine is globally available. There's a huge amount of stuff still to do, and you know, one would hope that you would have you know, the world's two biggest economies working hand in glove. And I think actually, you know, in, in the science area, there is much more cooperation, but the political, you know, the political theater is deeply negative. So yeah, you know, China absolutely bears a lot of blame for that, but it's not just China. Zanny Mitsubaros, thank you so much. Great to be with you. Thank you.